so I understand I have to stand here for TV, so we'll try to make this work. I'm getting a thumbs up, good. Um, well, yeah, I think Sheena and I have both experienced the best and the worst of social media, but I, I think that this connection and all of the people that I see in the room uh, are probably the best of it. There's basically one degree of separation between everybody who's here and Sheena, which is reason enough to show up to an event. Um, so I'm very, very honored to be here. And um, maybe let's, let's, let's start here. Uh, I am an obstetrician, um, which for me these days means that approximately you know, one day a week I see um, mothers and their families in my office. Um, you know, you see people who are pregnant a lot during their pregnancy. So you sort of get a window into sort of like just this period in people's lives. And then about twice a month I'm on the labor floor. The rest of my time, which is most of my time, I run a research program um, based at Harvard University that's ostensibly about maternal health. Um, and for years I've been on this quest to try to figure out how to make childbirth safer. Uh, but more recently I've realized that to actually make a difference in the way that we all collectively want to, we need a much bigger and bolder vision than safety in childbirth. That, uh, you know, we need a vision that treats childbirth not as a transient episode in the lives of some people, but as the foundational episode in the lives of all people. We need a vision that's not just concerned with how we keep people safe within the four walls of a healthcare facility, but how we ensure people are supported in the communities where they actually live their lives. Um, and probably most importantly, we need a vision that's not just concerned with the present, but as I heard this morning uh, repeatedly in the remarks that were made, um, we need a vision that's concerned with the future. And the basic pact that every current generation ought to have with the next one to make sure that we're leaving things at least as well as we found them. Um, up against a recognition that when it comes to the way that human beings are born in 2019, we may not be achieving that. It's true in my own country, and it's true in many ways across the world, but one of the galvanizing motivations for me, um, particularly now as a parent, is the realization that for an American today, uh, she is 50% more likely to die in childbirth than her own mother was. Americans today are 50% more likely to die in childbirth than their own mother was. Now, maternal mortality is heading the wrong way in the United States compared to every other OECD country, or even developing countries. Actually, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've been watching maternal mortality with our SDG goals go down uh, for 25 years of the trend line. And the United States of America is going the other way. But, you know, the United States is, uh, you know, we're high volume exporters of good ideas and bad ideas. We ought to be a cautionary tale in many ways. And, you know, it's not simply, well, it's not only that maternal mortality is going up. It's also the fact that if you're a black woman in America, you're three to four times more likely to die than if you're a white woman, irrespective of education or income. And that basic disparity is not fundamentally different from the rest of the world. In fact, in the UK, maybe it's worse. Maybe you're five or six times more likely to die if you're black than if you're white, irrespective of education or income, which requires some unpacking. And that, you know, death is uh, the canary in the coal mine of a deeper, wider problem. In my country, for every death, there are tens of thousands of cases of avoidable suffering. Globally, for every death, there are tens of millions of cases of avoidable suffering in childbirth from undertreated illness, but equally, uh, social isolation, economic disempowerment, and everything else that comes with treating childbirth as a cost rather than as an investment. So that's what I want to talk about. <laughs> um, and I want to start with a story. So this is um, a friend of mine named Charles Johnson. Has anybody, uh, does anybody recognize him? Has anybody heard his story? Um, I'm not sure the extent to which it's made it around the world, but Charles um, and his wife Kira went in to have their baby uh, three years ago at a tertiary academic medical center in California, actually in Hollywood, um, one of the best medical centers in the United States. Uh, and, you know, it was routine, scheduled, repeat, cesarean. And um, they did the delivery, and afterwards there are these beautiful videos that Charles took with his iPhone of Kira and their son Langston, and the whole family just sort of rejoicing in the moment. Um, in the hours that followed the delivery, um, 
Kira just started to not look quite right to Charles. Um, couldn't at first exactly put his finger on it, but she just wasn't herself. Then he started to notice some blood in the catheter and that didn't look right. He was just concerned. And he brought up his concerns multiple times to multiple people, to the nurse at the bedside, to the residents, to um, the other physicians that were around. And it just took a lot of time for them to be heard. Um, by the time they ordered a CT scan, by the time that they obtained a CT scan, Kira had liters of blood in her abdomen. Liters. And uh, even then, you know, the thing about taking care of young, healthy people is that they look fine until they don't. Young, healthy women are generally very good at compensating. Like, you don't see, at the point where you're seeing blood pressure issues, it's almost too late. But they brought her back to the operating room thinking that it would fix it in 30 minutes, that's what they told Charles. Uh, and the OR doors closing are the last time that Charles saw his wife, Kira, alive again. And as Charles tells it, there is no statistic that can convey what it was like for him to have to then go home and tell his other son, his toddler, that his mom wasn't coming home. And there are so many things that are deeply disturbing about this story. Of course, the fact that it happened. But, I mean, it's worth pointing out that Charles uh, is a person who had a lot of agency at this hospital. Uh, Kira was a very healthy person. She ran marathons. Um, One of the things that continues to haunt Charles to this day is the fact that uh, he wonders if he should have advocated more forcefully to get his wife to surgery quicker, but he was concerned that he'd be perceived as an angry black man. The other thing that really hits me about Charles' story is that his son Langston and my son Luca are the same age. Um, and uh, three years ago, uh, after helping uh, with probably delivering thousands of babies, literally thousands, um, I got to take one home of my own. And the experience of being in the labor room with my wife uh, cleaved my identity in half. Um, so you know, our quick story um, was uh, Julie, my wife, um, her, her water broke at like 36 weeks, so it was fine, but caught us a little, a little off guard. And uh, because our baby is half Indian and was 36 weeks, we had a pretty small, Luca was small. Labor progressed pretty quickly. And then we got to the second stage of labor. And man, like that is just like the trickiest as a clinician. Julie pushed for one hour, and then two hours, and then three hours, and then four hours, and then five hours. And it was like killing me. Because the obstetrician in me definitely had to take on what we should do. Um, but then the husband and partner in me was watching Julie with her like steely look, and she said that she had it and wanted to keep pushing. So I was like, OK. Um, and that's the thing. You know, at 3 AM, when a person's been pushing for two or three or four or five hours, god forbid, um, there's no objective way of knowing how big a baby's head is, or how big a pelvis is, or how the two are lined up. In 2019, there's no technology, there's no button that you push to tell you if it's going to happen. You just have to decide what you believe. Is it going to happen or is it not going to happen? And the longer you wait, the higher the odds that the baby will just deliver. You'll have an uncomplicated vaginal delivery. And thankfully, that's what happened in our case. But the longer that you wait, the higher the odds that the mom or the baby could be significantly injured. We know that. That's why we're there. So that's really tricky. Um, that's my setup to telling the story of the last half century of childbirth in America as a cautionary tale. So in the early 1960s, early 1970s, the cesarean rate in the United States was 5%. Okay? And that's on a base of a lot of technology and capacity and training. So we, in 1970s, we had modern anesthesia, modern blood banks, Caesareans have not technologically evolved very much. There's no laparoscopic caesarean. It was the same caesarean, 5%. And then in 1971, something happens, and the caesarean rate more than doubles in five years. Five years after that, it more than triples. Five years after that, it quadruples. 
And guess what happens five years after that? That's right, it quintuples. And then in 1990, uh, everybody in the world was um, seeing the end of the millennium come up. And uh, the year 2000 was something we were fixated on. So in the United States, we set a bunch of population health goals for America, which included a target BMI for our country, and it included a target cesarean rate based on the WHO recommendation at the time of about 10 to 15 percent. And in the early 90s, we do this. In fact, if you were to continue that trend line to the end of the decade, we would have hit our target. But instead, what we did in the mid-1990s is we completely changed our mind and reverse course. And then we did that. Now, I'm going to say this slowly. This represents a 500% increase in the use of this surgery in the last generation or two of mothers. 500%. There's no other healthcare service that has seen this kind of increase in utilization. When you look at the WHO bellwether surgeries, it's the ability to fix a long bone fracture, the ability to do an exploratory laparotomy, and the ability to do a cesarean. And of those three, the cesarean is the only one where you, once you install the capacity in any country, you see it swing up inexorably. And here's the thing. The paradigm of improving healthcare globally for decades has been um, really focused on the idea of there being too little care too late. Everything we do is about more, faster. This is a case where we've seen a 500% increase in the use of a major surgery. And over that, the same period, there's been 0% benefit to term infants. We're doing 0% better in terms of neonatal mortality or morbidity for term infants, which is what this surgery is designed to fix. And we've seen a 50% increase in maternal mortality. It's very hard to square. And there's all of this uh, conventional wisdom, by the way, about what's driving this up, and all of it is wrong. All of it. There's this narrative that, well, you know, moms today, it's true, look different than they did in the 1970s. It's true. Moms are older than they used to be. There is more obesity. There is more hypertension and diabetes. There's more in vitro fertilizations. There's more multiple pregnancies. All of that is true. But it turns out demographics in the United States explain very little of this trend because, well, cesarean rates have gone up in every demographic category. So if you're a healthy 18-year-old today and you're thin and your odds of getting a C-section have doubled in your lifetime. It's very hard to blame women for this trend. It's not that women are requesting these. It turns out less than a half percent of moms in the United States electively request a primary C-section. It's not even explained by medical malpractice or reimbursement policies, because during eras where those things have been fixed, this has continued to skyrocket. So not only have we seen a 500% increase with no benefit to infants and possible likely harm to mothers, um, we don't even know why. One way to try to understand it is to look across time. The other way is to freeze time and look across geography. So I'm about to show you is the United States, but every single country in the world has some version of this, um, which is particularly relevant as we are sort of fixated on um, getting women into facilities globally. And in every country, by the way, the way, the way we measure healthcare quality is at the facility level, almost always. So this is a one-dimensional graph, and what it shows you are cesarean rates. And every dot on here is a hospital in the United States from a nationally representative sample. And basically what it's saying is that C-section rates in the U.S. go from 7% to 70% at the hospital level. This is the only health care service. There's so many superlatives. This is the only health care service that varies by a full order of magnitude at the hospital level. And then the thing is, you can often go to a hospital with a high rate and ask why, and they'll tell you that they see a different patient population than the people on the other end. And to a degree, that's true. So what you say is, well, let's just look at the low-risk women then. And we actually have a very good way of defining that. And it actually doesn't matter how you define it. All the definitions pretty much get you to the same answer, which is, after you account for risk, you see more variation, not less. You don't see tenfold variation. You see 15-fold variation. And I'm going to say this slowly, too. This is the only healthcare service where after you account for risk, you see more variation, not less. And what that means is, 
in 2019, in almost every part of the world, the biggest risk factor for the most common surgery we perform on human beings is not a woman's personal preferences or medical risks, but literally which door she walks through. Um, a few years ago, we uh, started a project to try to understand why. Um, and one of the ideas we had was to go over to um, Harvard Business School, because one of the reasons why business schools exist, in addition to churning out MBAs, which are a great revenue stream for the university, uh, is that they study why different institutions perform differently. That's like kind of their main thing. So it seemed like a good place to go to understand why we see 15-fold variation in performance for very similar patients. And they helped us make a cartoon, which is to imagine the labor and delivery unit as a pressure tank. It turns out every pressure tank has a certain capacity of things that it can hold, and so do labor and delivery units or facilities. Only there are no rules about the volume, like what kind of capacity you need, how many labor and delivery rooms you need based on the number of people you take care of. There are no rules. So part of our work was actually to show that uh, there's a correlation between the number of C-sections you do and the number of women you deliver per room that you have. Does that make sense to everybody? That's just sort of like Newton's laws of physics. Two things can't occupy the same space at the same time. We actually found a hospital. We found two hospitals that have the same number of labor and delivery rooms. OK? This is a little bit of math. And one place does twice as many deliveries per year as the other. And they both thought they were at their capacity limit. The only way that's possible is if one place is moving people through a lot faster, right? So design matters. Um, and the thing is, it all filters down to a dichotomous choice that we have in healthcare all the time between doing the right thing and the easy thing. And they often don't line up. If there's a woman with a protracted active phase of labor who has, a cat, who has an ambiguous fetal heart tracing, who is also hypertensive and also has a fever, none of which are reasons to do a C-section in and of themselves. Um, you know, the easy thing to do is just to do the C-section. Supporting labor is harder. Um, I just like this. I don't have too many data slides, but we did prove this pressure tank idea. And the way that we did it is there's a city in the United States called Philadelphia that uh, during an era in the 90s, half of their labor and delivery units closed. And that meant that the remaining labor and delivery units got twice as busy because the population didn't change. So it set up a natural experiment where we could go in and try to understand what busyness does to a labor and delivery unit, sort of prove our pressure tank hypothesis. And so what you're seeing is on the x-axis for, is for any given woman in labor, how many other women are also in labor on that unit? And on the y-axis, you're seeing an odds ratio. And what this graph shows is that the more women who are in labor at the same time as you, the higher the chances are that you're going to get an intervention that speeds up the process, including a C-section. This is the same thing, only instead of looking at procedures, we looked at outcomes, like hemorrhage and infection. The busier that a labor and delivery unit is, the higher the odds of a hemorrhage or infection. Part of what's interesting here is that at some point, um, you see the trends like level off or decrease which means that at some point we figure it out and we do something in the United States. We get more resources, we call in more nurses, I don't know. But we just do it too late. And this problem is probably even more severe in low resource settings. Um, where you know the capacity constraints are even more stark and the workloads on the clinicians are even higher. Um, So the question becomes, like, what on earth do we do about this? So I want to zoom in on actually the opposite of a low resource setting and just show how technology does not necessarily fix this. Um, this is probably one of the most sophisticated labor and delivery units in the, in the world. Uh, this is McGee Hospital in Pittsburgh. And McGee Hospital, you know, the average labor and delivery unit anywhere in the world is in some corner that, you know, 
usually um, it's not the cash cow of the healthcare system. It's the loss leader. It's the thing that structurally, you know, labor and delivery requires staffing, whether it's midwives or nurses or whatever the case may be. 80% of the cost of running a labor and delivery unit anywhere in the world is paying highly trained people to wait for something to happen. So you don't, and you don't make money until that thing happens. We have a top heavy <laughs> cost structure because we see childbirth as a cost and not an investment. Uh, this is an exception, though. That's the point of the story. This is a 100-year-old freestanding women's hospital with an endowment and statues of pregnant women in the lobby. They do 10,000 deliveries per year. Um, they have a very wide catchment area. They take care of very sick people. And despite that, they actually have a relatively low cesarean rate. So a few years ago, I just showed up. Well, I called first, and then I showed up just to just sort of like see what they were doing. And this is the picture I took of their labor and delivery unit. So this woman is the nurse in charge of that unit that day, okay? And I'm convinced she has one of the hardest jobs in all of healthcare. Maybe just period, actually. What she's doing, she's got two computer screens in front of her. They're helping her figure out her nurse staffing assignments. So which nurse goes to which patient, okay? Then she's got four more giant screens that are her bed management system to figure out which person in labor goes to which bed and it's not just tracking the labor and delivery unit, it's also tracking all the inflow and outflow. So it's tracking the antepartum unit, it's tracking the postpartum unit, because if that gets filled, they back out onto the labor and delivery unit. It's tracking the NICU, the neonatal ICU, because if that gets filled, that causes problems. Um, then there are eight more screens on another wall, and each one of those screens has four CTGs on it. And other people have to watch it too, but they're like, you know, Vivian, while you're hanging out there, you may as well pay attention. And then my favorite part, do you all see that uh, whiteboard, that back wall? That has 15 columns and 30 rows. That is where she manually reproduces all the information on the computer because she doesn't like the way it's displayed. This is a human factors engineering disaster. And it wasn't until I watched her do her job that I realized that she is an air traffic controller. I actually went to the air traffic control tower of my local airport to just do a head-on-head -head comparison. And they are actually very similar jobs with one exception. In air traffic control, you'd never see one human being managing that much complexity because it would be unsafe. We did a formal calculation with an MIT graduate student who spent a weekend on the labor floor um, that her job would actually crash the world's fastest supercomputer, um, which of course she loved but should terrify all of us. <laughs> and, and she's fairly good at it, um, but it, it begs this question of how we unwind all this complexity. It's also the first time that I realized that the modern labor and delivery unit in most parts of the world um, is functionally an intensive care unit. A lot of people, when they think about an ICU, they associate it with a ventilator or some piece of technology. But for a health services researcher, what defines an ICU is the ability to staff one clinician to one patient. And at least in high income settings, that's the standard of care for anybody that's in active labor. That's what makes it an ICU. So the cardiac ICU of the hospitals in London, they can track vital signs in real time. That's what all those monitors are. The cardiac ICU can titrate medicine on a minute to minute basis. So do we, that's what we do with oxytocin. The only difference between an ICU and a labor floor is that on the labor floor, the operating rooms are actually attached, usually. Which means we have the most intense treatment environment of the entire hospital for what are fundamentally the healthiest people. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's happening. If you take 99% of American women, put them in an ICU and surround them by surgeons, you'll see a lot of surgery. But again, that begs a question about how on earth we unwind that kind of complexity. So I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I'll share just how we're thinking about it and what we're doing. Um, the first idea is that very little things in the modern clinical environment are intentionally designed for the users, which include the clinicians and also include the people that we serve. And what happens as a result is whenever we have an idea, we throw it into this environment and it creates more options. And that creates more decisions we have to make and just mathematically more ways that we can mess up. We have not made simplicity a design principle, which is the opposite of the way that technology innovation works in every other sector. 
Technology has made our lives simpler from the way we get around, the way we eat, to the way we communicate, in almost every other aspect of our lives. But literally every time there's a new technology in healthcare, think about it. It makes our lives harder. Why? The other is to realize like what's happening in the second stage of labor at 3 a.m. when someone's pushing for five hours. Which is, you know, there's no guideline that will ever, ever tell you how long the second stage of labor will be. So much of quality improvement is about adherence to protocol. And like maybe there'll be a guideline that will tell you the minimum amount of time that a woman should be allowed to push if everything's OK. But it'll never tell you the maximum amount of time. And if it's trying to, you shouldn't believe it, because it depends. You have to be able to trust experienced clinicians in the trenches to use their best judgment. But the thing is, childbirth has always been a team sport, always, for homo sapiens. We can get into the evolutionary basis of it later. But there is a shared complement of expertise between the person who has lived experience and the person who has technical knowledge, always. And um, we want experienced clinicians to use their judgment, but we want them to do it with all the information that should be available to them in the room. And it turns out that information just lives in the brain of multiple people. It lives in the brain of the person in labor herself who can tell you things that nobody else can. And not only preferences and symptoms, but things like how much energy she has to push at 3 a.m. four hours in. It's not a symptom. It also lives often in the brain of the person who's not delivering. Often there's another clinician, whether it's a nurse or somebody else, that has spent more time at the bedside than the person who's actually delivering. And so there needs to be some kind of systematic way of sharing knowledge. It's worth pointing out, too, by the way, that the team that comes together to take care of a woman in labor for every woman, every time, everywhere in the world, it comes together randomly. Because there's no way of predicting who's going to go in labor or who's going to be on the other end. And that team that is formed for the first time, for every labor, every time, has to become high performing for one of the most important moments of our lives. And we don't have a systematic way of thinking about that. And as a result, you know, 90% of all sentinel events in healthcare, 90% of all adverse events, 90% of all avoidable errors, they are fundamentally failures of communication and teamwork. It's not surprising. But it is telling, because when you think about stories like Charles and Kira, on her death certificate, Kira died of a hemorrhage. But you know, she was in a hospital that had a sophisticated blood bank in an operating room. She didn't die of a hemorrhage. What killed Kira was a failure of communication and teamwork. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that the team looks different in different places. Um, and particularly in low-income settings, there's a lot of untapped capacity there, because often women are accompanied by a female companion or a, a member of their family who are not integrated into the team, but are essential sources of support. So this is what we're trying, using these design principles of simplicity and teamwork. Um, it's going to sound like a ridiculously simple idea, but it actually went through a multi-year design and development process to come up with an idea that is ridiculously simple. So that's my warning. <laughs> There's like no AI involved. It's a, it's a whiteboard. Um, it turns out that almost every inpatient room in hospitals in most parts of the world, including the ones that we visited in Norway uh, yesterday, um, have some kind of whiteboard in it. Usually, they're for nurses to document things for themselves. Um, they're often highly variable in content and not intentionally designed. So we just made a big one, and we designed it. We made it big enough so that everyone in the room can see it, and we simplified it so that everyone in the room can understand it, particularly and especially the person in labor. It only has four components. The first part, you write down every member of the team, starting with the mom. And that's not just so that everyone knows each other's names. It's so everybody in the room has both the permission and the opportunity to say something, to speak their minds. There's a part where you write down the things that only the mother can tell you. There's a part where you write down the plan so people understand what's happening and they're on the same page. And then there's this, this is my favorite part. This is where you write down the next time that the whole team will come back together and talk about what's happening. And we don't prescribe what you write there. You can write anything that you want. But that is so uh, you don't feel like most, well, on my way to Europe this time, our plane was held on the tarmac, and the pilot never came overhead to tell us what was going on. And everybody was like, what's going on? And that's how all women everywhere in the world feel <laughs> when they're being cared for in labor. 
That simple act of just letting them know when you're going to get back together and talk creates incredible alignment, it turns out. Um, so that was our idea, and we're testing it. And we're also testing it differently, because the ambition is to uh, try to improve care for every person everywhere. So we intentionally designed it to be simple so it could work across multiple contexts. And we want to scale this so that we can improve care for the 120 million people who are going to give birth every year. Um, and so to do that, we knew that we needed more than proof that it worked at improving care. We needed actually proof that people can do it. Because if we were a pharmaceutical company or a device company, that would be the bar we'd have to clear first. It wouldn't matter if it worked if no, everybody hated it. Because it wouldn't get to, and like, why, that's like what we do over and over again. Um, so we made, we registered a clinical trial <laughs> And we publicly disclosed outcomes that had nothing to do with effectiveness and everything that had to do with feasibility, acceptability to not just clinicians, but to women and their families. And uh, we made a distinction between doing it and doing it right. We invested a lot of resources in demonstrating fidelity of implementation. Um, oh, sorry. This used to be a map of the world. And um, those, were, those are places in the United States on both coasts and in the middle. So we're in the heartland, and we're on the east coast and west coast of the United States. And this is a trial, actually. Uh, the, the trial is only in these locations. It's only at four facilities, but it involves uh, tens of thousands of families and hundreds of clinicians that are thousands of miles apart. It's actually a very complicated trial, especially when those are your outcomes, and they're not recorded, usually. Um, and actually, in the process of doing this work, outside of the trial, um, uh, much as I've seen people in the room do, people take pictures of this whiteboard, and they just go home and do it, because it's so simple. So people are doing it all over the country, and they're doing it in all these other places, as far as we know. And those are only the places where we get email. Um, and, and the data that we're collecting, um, we're, we're collecting data directly from patients. We're doing surveys. We're looking at clinical records. Uh, we're collecting data from clinicians. And then we're connect, collecting a lot of data that's relevant to teamwork. Turns out like teamwork, for how important it is, is a relatively nascent science. Um, much like culture. <laughs> People know good teamwork when they see it, but we're not particularly rigorous at defining what that actually means and systematizing it. Um, so what, where we are now, actually the trial will end in December formally. Um, that's when we'll publicly um, put the results up on a website and you know the paper will follow by months because of peer review. But uh, what we've been able to show uh, so far is that our primary endpoints around feasibility it's like people can do it. It's pretty simple. Um, and they don't hate it. There's no industry standard or benchmark for what acceptability should be for clinicians. Um, but you know, for all of us who've ever tried to get clinicians to change their behavior, generally speaking, clinicians don't like change. But we have uh, 85 to 90 percent acceptability for this. And uh, not just generally that they like it, but specifically clinicians and patients jointly believe that this is improving care, that it's creating, uh, like it's, it's actually improving decision making um, around mode of delivery, but around other things as well, that it's creating alignment, and that actually most encouragingly, um, women feel like they have a much better understanding of like what's happening to them. It turns out a lot of people leave their delivery experience without a full understanding of like what happened. Not even a lot of people, I would say, most, actually, most of the people that have cesareans, um, when they tell you why, um, those of us who do cesareans for a living have a very different narrative. Even when they tell you the story cold, like if you meet them in the supermarket and they find out you're an obstetrician and tell you their birth story, and they're like, you know, my son almost died because he had this cord wrapped around his neck and they saved him because they did the cesarean. And you're like, that's probably not exactly it, right? Uh, so we've done that, and actually, and we don't have the statistical power to prove this, but we do have hospitals in our trial that have seen historic lows in 15 years in their cesarean rates. We have a hospital that has seen a decrease in unexpected newborn complications. We have a hospital that's seen a decrease in postpartum depression as a result of doing this. And um, you know, those are hypothesis generating. We haven't proven it yet, but the next step is to do a large trial involving hundreds of thousands of families and try and prove that this improves care. Um, but I want to point out like, just what we mean when we say improve care. Uh, it means different things to different people. So we talk about safety and cost a lot. 
but one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is um, this paradigm in healthcare improvement where we treat dignity as a secondary luxury. That after we've attended to your safety, it's the thing that we'll get to. But we got to take care of your safety first at all costs. And what we found in the course of doing the trial and collecting the data, or come to believe, and what I think Charles and Kira's story demonstrates, is that it's, it's actually maybe the other way around, that dignity may be in service of safety. And what we mean by dignity, by the way, when people say patient experience, they're often thinking that it means customer satisfaction. I don't even necessarily, I think the, the idea of a positive birth experience may even be too narrow. Um, it's not about customer satisfaction. It's about dignity, which is valuing somebody's lived experience and seeing it as a complement to the technical knowledge that the clinician has. Um, so we've been thinking about that as well. And actually, one of the big challenges, and I'll, I'll, I'll close out on this idea, um, is that, OK, if we're trying to improve dignity as well, and we believe dignity is in service of safety, we need to actually more sharply define what that means. OK, and this is a problem. Because in our sharp focus on maternal mortality globally in the SDG goals in the United States, we've forgotten that uh, survival is the floor of what people deserve. Right? People often have goals and labor other than emerging unscathed from the process. But everything that we systematically measure are like, did we physically injure you or not? Survival is the floor of what people deserve. And in 2019, if we're trying to design a better system, we should be aiming for the ceiling, which is care that's not just safe, but also supportive and empowering. The problem is we haven't defined what the ceiling is. Um, so we're, we're starting to do that. And we, there are a lot of reasons why I, I believe that maternal health gets marginalized relative to other domains of health care. Um, one of the reasons is that we bundle it with child health. And often child health, I think, crowds out maternal health in volume and economic investment. The other is that moms are very good at advocating for nearly every progressive cause except for their own well-being. So you see mothers being incredibly powerful advocates in the United States for you know, there's moms against drunk driving, there's moms against guns, but there's, there wasn't like a moms for moms. So what we did a few years ago is we made one. <laughs> we, we put a 60-foot stage on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. in front of the Capitol building, and we used it to platform moms. To just, and that's where Charles told the story and, 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 and others told their story and tried to, to create a movement. Have you all heard of this thing called the opioid epidemic? No? It's in the news cycle like every day in the United States. And it's because middle-aged white men started to die more than they were before. And there was this thing where people were dying of drug overdoses in the United States. But all of a sudden, people cared. <laughs> and they called it an epidemic. And it was in the news cycle every day. And that's the ambition that we have with this. And we're, we're making progress. We actually got President Trump to sign a bill <laughs> uh, right before shutting down the government for several weeks. Uh, he signed a bill that at least got us to a place in the United States where we're tracking maternal mortality. We're making a difference. Um, and so we're going to do this year after year. It's called March for Moms. You can find it online. It's marchformoms.org. Right now, it's very focused on the United States and trying to appeal to people's sense of patriotism. But we're hoping that it can become larger than that. Um, and we're also starting to think about how we can drive a public narrative underneath it. So there's an element to this that requires affecting policymakers. But there's also a really important element to this that if involves uh, engaging our own local communities. Because um, the well-being of mothers and growing families ought to be a bellwether for the well-being of society generally. And we all have a role to play. But again, we haven't defined it. Uh, so we created a campaign called Expecting More. And it came from realizing that uh, you know, as we start to do this work, we get media inquiries all the time. But we were being very reactive. Like People would ask us a question, and we'd answer it, and it would end up in a newspaper. And like those um, messages were going out to 60 million people um, just over the summer. But we weren't being intentional or deliberate about how to proactively drive a narrative around this. So we, we created a website called Expecting More. Uh, and the ambition of the website is to try to define what this, what it means to want more than emerging unscathed from the process. So there's a whole narrative campaign that tries to integrate the voices of women and thought leaders uh, and, and other people as well. Uh, so I'll just end with this, which is my closing slide for every talk I give, uh, which is my favorite definition of a designer. A designer is anyone who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. 
I love that because it's how I think of the kind of people that Sheena curates to come into rooms like this. Uh, and it's how I think about my job too. So thank you all so much. <laughs>